Well, hi everyone and welcome to our third on-air event for Designers for Learning. Today is February 12th and I am very happy and honored to be joined by my guest who I'm going to do my best to Good luck. make her name not sound Irish. <laughs> Beth? Oi. <laughs> I did the oi. Could you just say your last name? Oh, Yarzen. Oh, Yarzen. And I'm having trouble because Beth and I started out together um, in the PhD program at Old Dominion University, and she was always Susan Allred on my screen. And then I Correct. came to find out you don't go by Susan, you nope. go by Beth. Correct. And then in the process of us going through the program, uh, she got married, and this is her new last late name. Right. So but my full legal name now is Susan Elizabeth Allred Oyarzen. So it has 25 letters in it, I think. But <laughs> and you go by Beth. And I, just Beth. It's fine. That's fine. You just go by Beth. That's well, all you excellent. need. Excellent. So um, the topic of our, uh, our, our event today is um, just a variation on the theme of what the first two were. Uh, the Designers for Learning is, with hope, going to be a platform where we link instructional designers and instructional design students in some type of pro bono platform uh, with social enterprises, nonprofits, and what, what have you, uh, with the purpose of giving students the opportunity for service learning. And um, so Beth's background, and I'll let her explain it um, in, in, a, in a moment, but in a nutshell, uh, you currently work right at uh, University of North Carolina in Wilmington, right? Correct in the e-learning office and then as I mentioned uh, she's currently in the instructional design and technology PhD program at uh, Old Dominion University so what a perfect person to talk to about practical opportunities learning opportunities for students so Beth did you want to add to your background and your bio or why you're interested in this topic sure um, well I'm a teacher at heart my whole my entire career has been teaching in some way shape or form and um, I was a high school mathematics teacher. My undergraduate degree is in mathematics, and I taught high school mathematics for nine years around this area here in Wilmington, North Carolina. After that, I, uh, while I was teaching high school, I pursued my master's in instructional technology from UNCW here. Um, graduated with that in 2005, and then got hired here at the university, working in the education department, um, assisting faculty in their online learning endeavors, and started teaching online. Um, in undergraduate education courses um, and so then from there this office opened around what 2007 with one person and now we've grown to three so I migrated over here to this office for the third position in 2010 and uh, so I've been teaching online for about six years and uh, I've also been in Old Dominion for about five years, I think. And so right now you're main, you start out teaching high school kids, right? Correct. And now you're moving more graduate students, would you say? Or is that kind no, of a mix of undergrad? All of or? my uh, students are undergraduate in, okay. in education, but I teach an undergraduate instructional technology course and I teach an undergraduate instructional design course for future teachers. Okay. Whether they're going to be at uh, elementary, middle, or high school teachers. Okay. And so um, Beth and I, um, well, she's been very nice to, to tune in on my first two. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to talk to her about this whole idea of practical learning opportunities and um, what she, her perspective is from being a master's student in instructional design all the way through to now working with faculty um, in kind of that idea of reaching outside what you typically just do in the classroom to trying to find real life clients and real life projects to work on and so what, what you want to kind of fill in sure. some of the things we've been talking about um, yeah I my experience with applied learning I think as a high school teacher I, I started with teaching an AP statistics course and they had to go out and find sort of statistical projects so they could run data and do that kind of thing um, and so I think that's where I began sort of what we call here at UNCW is applied learning. I think you were calling it service learning, but you mm -hmm. hear several names here and there. Um, moving into UNCW and uh, my graduate work, we had the, the instructional technology program here is very much applied. And as a matter of fact, our entire university has a um, applied learning focus. And um, so 
I, we had projects within our courses that were client-based and so we were working for the instructor but we were also working for a client um, and doing reports or projects uh, and so that was a really great experience and not something I had had as a student much up until my graduate work um, and I, I really try to incorporate that into my teaching as well and also now in the Office of E-Learning, we are the client a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for the students. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting part of the experience as well. So what I want to drill down in, like you said, everybody calls it a little bit different thing. Um, the, my guest that I had last week very much called it service learning. Sometimes right. it's called a practicum. Sometimes it's internships. And I love the concept of applied learning because um, that actually sounds very broad, right? We can... <laughs> It could be project based. It could be you know right. through an internship, whatever. Um, but what I'm interested in is kind of talking to you. And it sounds like you've had both sides of it. Is the actually three sides of it as a student as well as the instructor trying to set it up, and then also as the client, as the recipient of the um, the work done by the student. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of it. So like maybe if we could start with like the instructor side of it. Okay. What are some of the um, things that wait, as you're setting it up? that you look for in terms of a client? Do you, do you actually uh, find the client for the students or do you find it works best for the client, uh, the student to find their own? Well, teaching fully online, it's mostly best to let them find the client on their own. We have some forms that are attached with uh, the idea that they have to give the potential client and so they know what they're getting into. It's just informative and they also have to sign off that they agree to these sort of, um, you know, certain a number of meetings with the student and that the oh, guidance okay. and that kind of stuff. Um, so, and a lot of times my online students are, are not located in Wilmington, so it's difficult for me to uh, find something that might work for them. Um, so they find their own client, they get these forms, they submit these forms to me once they have somebody that will agree and I have to approve the topic of the project uh, as well. And then there's just certain stipulations as they go through. There's, you know, a uh, that are minimum. Of course, a lot of the students go above and beyond, but there has to be at least two progress meetings with the client um, and then I can be present if there's an issue. Uh, most of the time, I don't. Uh, get involved, get involved mm -hmm. in the meetings unless I have to uh, and most everything goes smoothly of course with anything there's always an issue here or there mm -hmm. but um, so there's at least two process meetings and a final meeting um, for the grade and I do take the the clients input on the grade although I do have final say so usually. okay and um, so and then, then that's all in the documentation right and then um, in terms of the you're saying you need to sign off on what the students project is, which I'm assuming is so that the scope is, you know, fulfills sure. the requirements of the cl right. class, right? So how formalized is that? Do they have to have like a course contract with you or is it just a matter of you review this, you know, some documents? Well, most of these, since mine are going to be teachers, they're, they're instructional projects, so they're working with the teacher in the school. So the projects can vary because they, they're going to be different level subject matter experts. There's math, there's social studies, there's, um, and so the, that's why I let them sort of choose their topic because we're looking at instruction, not necessarily their content. They should be the subject matter expert and the teacher should be the subject matter expert, whoever they're working with at that point. Um, <clears throat> and so it is broad in that sense, but there are project requirements in the sense that they have to design a unit. So they're designing and delivering a unit or a lesson of instruction. Um, and so there are certain requirements within that that they have to have, like a uh, you know a collaborative activity, okay. be, you know those mm -hmm. kind of generic um, requirements. Mm -hmm. And um, then from your perspective, when you you mentioned that you're also then the sometimes the recipient of the uh, the activity when you're kind of the client in the relationship. So yes. how does that? Like, what are some of the <laughs> It's very, very similar. So these are usually grad students and not my undergrad. So it's a whole different scale of project. It's a lot bigger usually. So there's a little bit more responsibility on our end. And it can be a class project or an internship. A lot of times they're doing some survey research um, as to, you know, looking for uh, a problem that our office has identified and they're trying to help solve. Um, and it's interesting, or they're doing some sort of development project. Uh, we get grad students to develop 
tutorials and things for faculty or little short uh, professional development courses for faculty through our office and so it can be it can be a variety of, of different projects but the same sort of setup applies there's a certain amount of meetings that have to take place there's um, you know a final meeting with the instructor that we have to you know go through the process and talk about what they learned over the process um, uh, it's just a little bit more involved at the grad level than the undergrad level. Okay. And then you mentioned when we were in our back channel when we were uh, talking about it, I said, asking you, well, what do you think the advantages of doing Obviously, it's a lot of work for everyone involved for them. It is. <laughs> you're, you're saying you're asking the client to commit to a certain amount of um, help and be agreeable that you're working with a student and the things that in inherently come along with that. Um, yeah. so, so, you know, what uh, What do you think then, the flip side, the, if those are the kind of the costs of, of this, what do you think the benefits then are in terms of the students learning? Because I, I truly have not found all that much literature when I've, I've been doing some digging. There's a lot of like anecdotal case studies, oh, this has been great and my students, you know, the perceived learning yeah. is great and satisfaction, but I'm just kind of curious your perspective on the, well, like the actual learning outcomes. When I was a student doing these types of projects, for me, it, it gave a level of uh, responsibility. Like you were actually responsible for something that's going to be produced and given out. It's not just something that you are writing for your instructor to mm -hmm. see. So having that broader, I don't know what you want to call that, responsibility, um, made me put more work into it. Um, mm -hmm. I put a little, I, I wanted to put more effort into it as the student um, because there, it had more meaning, I think. Um, and also just working with different people other than your instructor gives you more of a sense of what you're going to be doing when you mm -hmm. get out into the job um, and actually doing it for, for a job. Um, and the, the collaborative aspect, I think a lot of times courses tend to be, I do the assignments, I hand them in, it's very individual to you and the instructor. And with this type of uh, activity, it's much more collaborative. You're working for several people, you're working with people, it could be a group-based project, um, and you learn skills doing that that you wouldn't necessarily learn individually um, that you might need in the workplace. And I want, I want to say like politics. I don't want to oh, say absolutely. playing politics. Yeah, but yeah, learning yeah. how to navigate certain situations is important for work scenarios sometimes and and yeah. you can get involved in those in these types of projects which can be good and bad sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> but either way you could take that as a what we call the teachable moment you know absolutely and yeah. Use that, and you don't necessarily get that with that individual. Here's the assignment. Turn it in. Yep. Um, this semester, uh, in the class I'm teaching, the students have to go out and find a client, and so we've really been focusing most of our live class time each week on what you're talking about, kind of those interpersonal consulting skills. Right. Um, for example, a student will come in and have a pretty clear idea of what the project's going to be, and they go back for the second meeting, and maybe there are additional people in the room who have different ideas, and the person they originally talked to had. A chance to think about it and the scope changed. So having those types of skills, like how to how to deal with changes in scope, how to deal with um, people who have a set idea of what the solution is, but you're you want to steer them a different direction or you know, those types of things. Right. And um, even, you know, difficult clients or difficult situations, um, you know, even as us being the client, we've had, you know, situations where students have come in and there's there's been issues uh, either with us as the client or them as the student and that you know we've had to go and have that meeting with the instructor and say this is just not gonna work <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then what do you do with that sense because the course is only so long yeah then you've got um, the scope of the, of the semester to deal with as well yeah right absolutely. but it's interesting um, to deal with all those kind of problems that you wouldn't necessarily get a chance to do and so I guess that's where my why I'm so intrigued by all this. You know, like I said, anecdotally, everyone's had experiences working on these real life authentic projects. But I really struggle. And I talked to Rick Schwer in my first session. He was asking me, like, what ba literature base am I going to? What like help right. is out there? And I really didn't, haven't seen much. And um, even when the students, for example, in class, will say they'll have a, an interpersonal issue. And other than me kind of shrugging my shoulders and say, well, that's human nature and that you just need to, <laughs> <laughs> you 
<laughs> through Work experience, <laughs> you need to know what works for you. And, you know, something that I say may come across differently if you say it. And so right. these are things that I think you learn through practice. But I don't know. Are there uh, places that's, to go <laughs> where we can help? you know, provide guidance, you know, almost like instruction on how to... Yeah, um, and that's really interesting deal. because the same topic comes up when we talk start talking about behavior management for classroom instruction because that's mm -hmm. when our teachers go out into the field, that's the biggest thing they say when they come back is I wish I, I would have had more behavior management techniques or practices because that's the first thing they run into for issues is they don't know how to manage a classroom. And it's exactly, I say the same exact thing that you say, different strategies work for different people. You have to learn through practice and it comes with experience. You can't, it's not, uh, this technique may work for this teacher and not work for you. It's, it's very individualistic in some way. Yeah, like a classic example that happened, I think, almost to all the students in the classes, um, and particularly the one who is a little bit ahead of the curve in talking to our clients, um, she, she went in and had an, an idea what she wanted to do and suddenly they got so excited and talking about the scope of the semester, it's more the scope of what she was willing to do on a volunteer basis. And so I just said to her, well, instead of doing this massive thing, take a chunk of it and create a prototype. And, just, you know, even those types of things where um, if I'm not kind of staying on top of it, it, the whole project could really just, you know, you know, spin out of control for the poor student, <laughs> and then she's not They're learning spinning. anything. You know, she's just you know juggling all these balls with the client instead of actually working right. on the, the project that she's um, you know intending to do. So, can, well, back to what you were talking about before. Is there any way you could share some of these like things you have in your contracts that you've got, or whatever you call it, project agreements? Um, I well, the graduate forms. I think I have this up already that I could share. Um, I don't have my forms up on the internet, but I know the graduate school does. And let me see. Of course, I can't find it when I want to find it. I can post it in the chat here in a minute. <laughs> um, well, how, while you're looking for that, how about this idea? As you're saying, your classes are online. Um, so your students are finding, they're not really having virtual work experiences, they're just finding local within their community, right? So they're not, right. um, okay. Because that, that was one thing I was thinking, if I work with, like get a, say a roster of nonprofits that are that want to play along and need help, part of the requirement would be then that not necessarily everyone would be residing in Chicago or wherever they, they are. And I don't know, that brings in a whole a, a different dimension <laughs> of you know, not having an opportunity for face-to-face, -face, you know, chatting right. with the clients. And I put the, uh, it says unnamed because I haven't oh, typed yeah. my name in there, but those are, if you look under the in internship forms on that page, that has some of the, that's the graduate okay. um, forms that they have to use. There's the agreement forms, the review forms, uh, the site registration if, if, if somebody's interested in becoming an internship uh, um, partner with uh -huh. that program. Uh -huh. So you can see some of those forms there and that would be for the internship. Now for classes it's more individualized and probably not as quite as involved as those forms but you can take and modify. Mm -hmm. Well thank you. That's okay. I, 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 haven't, I haven't come across anything even that, <laughs> that formalized. I just kind of made my own, like for the class I'm teaching I kind of came up with this course contract from between myself and the students and then had a requirement for them to also come up with a project contract that they work on kind of a proposal with the clients and I just kind of <laughs> pulled some ideas out of there. Yeah. So, um, now what about the idea of um, everything we've talked about so far are individual projects mm -hmm. and in some of the things I've read, um, for example I think in our, the class that you and I were in last semester um, we looked at the, uh, I think Florence had run um, with a kayak company and that looked like it was more of a Group of project. students, yeah, working. So what do you think the pros and cons are of that, of having a group of students work with a um, for an applied learning? Well, coming through that program, I did several uh, group projects with clients. And um, it depends on the group size, I think, and obviously the, the who you're grouped with. I found the larger the group, the more difficult it was. I think one time well, there was one, and this is just personal experience, nothing based on research, um, but there we had a group of four once and uh, that proved to be too many. I think it's two to three working on that kind of intensive project is enough. Um, and 
there was also differences when you were able to select the group yourself versus having the group selected for you. Um, okay. at the, for me, at the grad level, when we were able to select the group ourselves, we tended to pick people that, you know, could complement us. Um, and we knew their working style and then but if they were just randomly assigned or um, made by the instructor oftentimes we had issues to work out at the beginning um, that were a little more difficult um, to get started on the project because we're like okay so what's your working style <laughs> you, oh, know, right, right, you, right, have right. To get, you have to get to know each other mm -hmm. all over again but sometimes if you're in a cohort program uh, which is nice you can you can build those relationships th through the courses and um, that becomes easier uh, mm -hmm. they had a thing in the program for a while that they wanted to switch groups for every project every class and uh, that proved to be uh, difficult uh -huh. on the students Oh, this is nice. We've got someone adding your links. They're putting it in our little wiki there. Oh, good. <laughs> this oh, collaboration happening right here. Right? <laughs> Um, so in the class I'm teaching this semester, I also um, um, you talked a little bit about um, the, the students having to have a certain number of meetings with their clients, but then how are you keeping up in the class I'm teaching this semester, I'm making it a requirement for the kind of six to seven core week, weeks of the, when they should be working with their clients, I want them to post on the Blackboard blog so I at least have some, like 600 words <laughs> at least a week to work right. with to make sure that they're not having any significant problems that they aren't reaching out to me through email or whatever. So how formalized is that process that you're, as far as your tracking of what they're doing? Well. At the very beginning, you can let them know, email, and that there, if there's any issues, you can email me outside of the student directly if they wanted to, the client could. Um, also, if you look at that forms page again, there was the, uh, the review form. And that's a form that has to be sit down with the student and the client and they fill that out and, and give that, turn that in. That's the mm -hmm. formal process. But informally, they could speak to me at any time mm -hmm. uh, but that sort of goes towards their grade and their record um, as to what their progress is and if you, you look at the form you can see there's a goal setting they have to set their goals and then you go back at the review time and see if those if those goals have actually been met and so yes. are they teach is your class synchronous then uh, or do they have the opportunity like on a weekly basis to share war stories of how their projects are going or how does um, that work? The MIT program uh, the, that's what we call it, it the yeah. instructional te Masters of Instructional Technology program. They have a synchronous to delivery, delivery, God, why can't <laughs> I say that all of a sudden? <laughs> Much like Old Dominion where they have mm -hmm. live video and they, and they also have asynchronous. They have people in the classroom and they have people okay. away. So it's very similar to that. So they have um, synchronous delivery. My class, I have optional synchronous meetings. Okay. Um, my class is listed as asynchronous and so but I have times like I'll do a morning time and an evening time and they can choose to come to these sessions if they if they want to um, but they don't it's not a requirement because I don't have it specific like Monday Wednesday mm -hmm. not I don't have a specific time attached to my class um, but the component is there if they should want to use it so do they tend to use it or is it more just when they get stuck um, it depends. Some use it and so, some really latch on to that synchronous and some just out of convenience do not want to lock themselves into a time because it's an online class. Um, so there's some resistance with it. Um, and I would say more have the resistance than more latch on to it. But I think it's changed uh, over the past um, five years. There's been more that are leaning towards the synchronous than than uh, there used to be. Mm -hmm, Just because mm -hmm. technology is better and uh, they're more fluent with it as yeah. you know, students come. But Oh, I can tell even in our um, Adobe Connect sessions, you know, the first couple years it was, um, you'd have, the, I can't get my audio working so all they would do is text chat. Well now we've got every session everyone's got their video going, they've got their audio going and they're, most right. people have a headset. You know, it's not quite as right. and as a People have actually used their videos when we have synchronous meetings more so than they used to. Oh, oh somebody sure. put my graduate portfolio up there. Nice. I was, there's a, this is another website since we're using this little wiki that I'm going to put up there. This is our, uh, our university-wide QEP, uh, which we are grounding in the applied learning. Um, 
are for sex for the quality enhancement plans mm -hmm. that you have to um, to do so our whole university is sort of moving to this kind of uh, model and um, so if you know kind of putting your other hat on not your just your teacher hat but your like instructional design consultant hat when you work with faculty what are the what's the process you go through when a faculty member comes in and it has never either new to the school or has never done this. So where would you kind of start out guiding them in the process? Well, a lot of times <laughs> we call it we call our office the the tech therapy office because yes. We do a lot of just chatting, you know. <laughs> it will be okay. <laughs> right, you know, it's more of like, you know, this is going to be fine. We are here to help you. Here are some forms, just much like I've given you this information. Yeah. I'll give them all this information. We have some resources up on our, our, our website. And uh, since we're adding stuff, I'll go ahead and add that. This is our Office of uh, eLearning website. And uh, we have some resources up there. We ha we try to put stuff for students up there for tutorials for all the different technologies. So we try to make it as seamless for the instructor as possible. And of course, as our office, we we promote do it being the client um, uh -huh. to the uh -huh. student. Be like, you know, if you want to incorporate this kind of stuff and. Since it's part of our quality enhancement plan, a lot of offices on campuses are opening up in that manner, um, and so it's it's easier to find these types of activities. Um, and if you look at our website under events, you'll see that our office is actually going to be putting on a conference. <gasps> Yay! Um, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> right can here. I join, or do I have to be a member of your <laughs> no, 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 like, faculty? Can, um, but and it's on the the journey from learning to life, and we're talking about exactly this thing these applied learning experiences and are you learning what you need to learn on the job anyway there's more about that on the website um, that's awesome yeah so it and all kind of ties together in some so you're saying I, I get it get the part where you know, if you're working if you're in teacher ed you're gonna be working with schools or whatever but in those that it's uh, more your instructional design program and they're going are they mainly working with their own workplace or are they going out to no, places they volunteer at or what that uh, program has made some uh, client I don't want to say clients partnerships with mm -hmm. several industries here and elsewhere they have one place in DC I know that just hired one of the students that they're doing internships uh, through them and then they have several um, corporate businesses here in town that they have partnerships that they can place interns with um, and then if the intern wants to find forge another partnership there's those forms on the website they could do that as well um, and so it, it could be a variety of things and and in the program as well as you know instructional technology there are uh, different tracks you know you have mm -hmm. people going to k-12 you have people going to training so there's a there's a variety of <laughs> options mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Um, they can choose to have these, um, you know, have the instructor sort of set something up for them if they can't find anything, or they could forge on their own and try to find some partnership. So do you th think, I think you said you like the, it works kind of well, it sounds like it works pretty well either way. Um, would you say it's nice to have the, the forged partnerships there as kind of a backstop in case they can't find it like yeah. how do you how are you kind of using those relationships right especially yeah it? especially for the internship because that's a huge requirement at the end of the master so I mean to have a backup plan there for that um, but like I said the offices on campus are really really open like I did my internship with the uh, schools uh, with the Science and Math Education Center that was here on campus because I was teaching math at the time and that was a perfect fit for me and they had not hosted an intern before and I just went over there and asked mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, well, can I can I be your intern <laughs> right and I they said that, great <laughs> see, I think um, as much as I like this idea of you know setting up nonprofits or whoever it might be to be there as kind of a backstop there's a skill to putting yourself out there and asking for work because just even knowing what questions to ask, I had some students in my class say, "Well, um, they're just learning, so that's they're, they don't know their skills aren't fully defined when <laughs> when they're going out asking for jobs." So they were having uh, finding willing participants, but then when they got down to the conversation of, "Well, what can you do for me, or what can we work on?" There was then that kind of skill gap <laughs> in terms of 
uh, well, I'm just in the program now, so uh, you know. So it kind of was going down for our our particular class. They were creating instructional design plans, right. or maybe creating a prototype. So something right. that, that seemed to be very manageable. If you'd kind of take, you know, at the end of this experience, I'll, I'm going to hand you an instructional design plan that then you could take and 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 develop it later, versus actually having a, a fully blown online module or something like that which gets to your point earlier of like the scope of the semester how much realistically can they get done right and that's that the planning of the 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 project you know the project planning and the approval process becomes very important at that stage because that defines the scopes the goals of the students and um, and everybody has to sign off on that um, and so the instructor, the client, and the students, because they have to sort of set their own goals in a sense as well. And so I think as long as that process is done really well, um, and it's hard to do really well really thoroughly if you're only talking about a 16-week semester yeah. course. So it doesn't always work, but as, as much formality as you could put right there in the beginning, I think it would help through the whole process, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh, I'm seeing questions. Um, let's see. I don't know what Lisa's asking. How popular are they? And I don't know what the they is. And then, <laughs> Peg, do you know what she might be talking about? I don't know. Oh, and some of the artifacts in my portfolio probably are not accessible because that was 2005 and up um, that I graduated. So I apologize if any links are broken up front. Yeah, um, I know that I shared mine uh, when I took my consulting class. Back at IU, I shared it with the students this semester, and I felt really bad. Everything they clicked on was a broken link, so yeah. it didn't look like Well, it. some of the things that I developed in software that doesn't exist anymore, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, okay, let's take us a couple minutes and talk about, like, the whole aspect of this then becoming part of their portfolio. Uh, to your point, the, what I created in 2005, 6, 7, it looks pretty cheesy now. <laughs> it's not, well, it's and mine's crazy. tiny for some reason. I don't understand why the font is so tiny, but it is. So there's the advantage of, yeah, what you're creating are artifacts that can go toward your port portfolio, but maybe you want to kind of keep <laughs> keep making them fresh every few years so that it doesn't look like you're right. you know, old fashioned yeah. <laughs> your your skills or I should add my I should just recreate it and add my doctorate stuff up there. I just haven't done it. <laughs> so um what what are there then really on the not requirements, but what do you encourage students as they're going through these experiences to be able to retain what they're doing so they can take it to a job interview or use it to get a job? Um, you know, I, I t it's funny. I, I become, like I said, our office is sort of a counseling center. It's the same sort of idea. The students come to me very frustrated at times. They're like, so-and-so's not doing their way in the group, or, or right. you know, I can't get the client to do this. And um, it's, I take all of those as like the teachable moment and say, well, I usually say about, you know, if the group member is employing their weight, I'm like, well, when you work in a school system as a teacher, you're going to be on curriculum committees. <laughs> right. And the same exact thing is going to happen there, and you're going to have to learn how to navigate that situation. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of... I sort of put the responsibility back on them in some way without trying to step in is my initial reaction. Um, and then, you know, if it, if it escalates to a point where, you know, you need to step in, but I've never had to break up a group. Mm -hmm. And that says something, I think, in the end. I think really that they they can navigate the situation and figure out how to make it work or they just sort of go, I'll just, I'll just pull you know, to pick up the slack and um, do it. My, the, just do it. Just do mm -hmm. it. Do it myself or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. Usually, I don't know in the end <laughs> right, what exactly right. happened. But I also don't wait that project enough to where that 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 sole project is going to determine their whole grade. It's mm -hmm. a it's a chunk of their grade. But let's say that student didn't pull their weight in that group, and yet they still got a good grade on that. But then if they waver on all of the individual things, they're still going to end up hurting in the end, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So I think yeah. that's an important aspect as well, um, mm -hmm. that's, that they can't get carried. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and I have certainly written and talked enough about my rants on group project work because I tend to <laughs> feel like I'm the one that's in the group that I can't get anyone else to do anything. But that's sort of life and, you know, 
It is. It and kind of ha it happens, and so you kind of have to build those skills as well. You get stuff at the deadline, and get you got to get stuff done. So you right. got to. And as the client, we just had actually an intern that was not meeting their goals um, that they had set for themselves and we had to call a big meeting with the instructor, had the student come in, we had a long conversation, um, which is extra work for us to mm -hmm. do, but it was very helpful and it was a positive conversation and he, this student knew that they were messing up and mm -hmm. they didn't know how to fix it. And so it, it turned into a very positive thing that gave him the tools that he needed to sort of fix the situation and had a very open dialogue. Um, and I mean, those, those situations arise and, and usually it's not as bad as you anticipate it mm -hmm. going to be. Like we were scared going to that meeting, like he's going to be angry. It's going to be mm -hmm. like this big thing. And it usually isn't. <laughs> Well, and I'm finding the same thing when the students get stuck. Like to them, it's like, I'm stuck. I don't know where to go. Oh my gosh. I, you know. oh my and then usually it's like, honestly, I don't think I've had a conversation with a student in Skype or where, however we connect that's been over 10 minutes. It's, and then like they go skipping off. <laughs> right. Very happy. And they're off. Right. <laughs> they're and like, then okay. they're off. The problem, it's like, and that's why I was saying I incorporated the blog because I think there are these little hiccups that we could, you know, if they just tell me about them or if some even just, I'm hoping to encourage some peer-to-peer -peer where there would be some suggestions and help from classmates. And we're just not there yet because we're not that far into the projects yet, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, I did want to um, ask, see if you noticed a question. Yeah, yeah, the focus on transfer of skills as opposed to software tools. Very much so. I think there's a focus on on both, um, especially in the, in the graduate arena. There's definitely... Um, more focus on the theory and the actual process than there is on the outcome. Mm -hmm. And so that process being the application of the theory, the plan, all of that stuff. Um, there are some courses that are more geared toward development and there's more courses to be, you know, focused toward theory. Same with the undergrad, like my instructional design class, which is a uh, is more theory focused and they have the group projects and paper writing and working with the teacher and then my instructional technology class is more focused on on tool training but it's also application of of the tools um, but there's also tool training incorporated with it so I think sometimes it varies on on content but I think overall the focus of the entire program and of my courses there's definitely transfer of skills and application of those skills Mm -hmm. more so than just tool training. And that came up uh, in the class I'm teaching. It's called Consulting Skills for Instructional Designers. And so in the first week of class, I asked everybody to go out and write an operational definition for instructional design um, based on what their context is going to be. So if, like you, you're in more of an internal consultant versus myself, I'm more of a freelance instructional designer. Some people are working for the military, so that depended. And one student came back, and I thought it was interesting, had gone out and looked up a lot of job descriptions, and they are heavily focused on tools. Yeah. Um, so where we like to say we sell our our ability to design quality instruction <laughs> in the job market you also then have to have the ability to use mm -hmm. the top tools and so that's a component I really didn't like you're saying and, and I'm kind of leaving it up to them whatever tools are applicable for what they're working on go right. for it but, I um, do that as well my instructional technology course they have a choice of tools I don't I let them uh, usually every project they have a choice of tools I don't I don't lock them in because different school districts use different things and so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I try to leave, I try to put as much choice in my in my course as possible so they can sort of navigate but but still meet the requirements at the same time right right and um, Peggy's asking me if I have a link for my course description I'm I tend not to be able to do things and talk at the same time so I will definitely find that and put it in the wiki and then also I did want to put in a plug for the two textbooks that I'm using this semester um, the first one is the block consulting book and the full title um, eludes me right now I don't think oh I Peggy asked if I had a built-in peer evaluation for their projects I do oh, that yeah. in my um, my instructional technology course I haven't incorporated it into my instructional design course yet because I haven't taught that one in a while, but I want to incorporate it in that one too. Um, 
that's also part of learning to be a teacher that and I've incorporated that as part of their interaction they have to sit they I pair them up for every project and they have to grade each other and give each other feedback um, and then I get to see their grades and feedback um, as part of their submission with their final submission um, and so that I can also comment on how they do that because that's also going to be a very important part of their job um, as being a teacher and so uh, yes definitely the peer evaluation and that's really helped the since I've incorporated that, it's really helped the products. The products have become amazing. So, um, you, it's, you, and you think it's just that they know that they got to pull their weight? Is that why? Or well, they edit. It? They get the feedback, and then they edit before okay. I ever see it. And before. Oh, 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 oh I see. Okay, so they're review. Okay. okay, they're revising. See, which once again, I was before. trying to do th two things at once. <laughs> I couldn't listen. I couldn't listen and put that link in the chat room at the same time. I'm sorry. Um, so I love that peer evaluation piece, and and um, I just taught instructional technology this past semester, and that was the first time I had incorporated that um, in there. And I have rubrics and everything, and they grade with their rubrics, and they give each other feedback, and they really enjoyed that. I actually did that in lieu of discussion boards. I didn't put any discussion boards in my class. This was the interaction that they did. Mm -hmm. it was the peer um, the peer grading interaction for their um, asynchronous, and it worked beautifully. Wow, I wish I had known that. So, okay, so here's back to my original question. Like, how do we share that? Like, how we're all struggling with these same issues. It's yeah. Like, is there a resource, or is it just trial and error stuff? I think, and stuff at this I think point? We, we have to do research on it. I mean, <laughs> we have to yeah. put together some research studies, and and because like everything I'm speaking about is based off of just my experience and what I see with my courses, and and like you said, you have trouble finding. Um, research that's talking about this, and I think that says something about what we should do. <laughs> yeah. And Did I you can, see how I used we? Yeah, we. I love it. <laughs> Yay. I told her in the back channel in Skype that eventually my designers for learning is going to be, if I keep using we and our, everyone will think there's this big group of people and that they're that part of it. we all start doing we're all, this. We're all in it. We, and all of a sudden, someone will go, hey, wait a minute. I didn't join any group. <laughs> Um, but uh, the consulting, you know, for my particular class, it kind of dovetails, like some of these consulting skills are some of the skills we're talking about when you're working with clients. So that's kind of nice because the skills we're learning in the class all would apply generically to what we're talking about as far as an applied learning um, thing. And then the second book that, um, is a book by Judith Hale, and I'll put that in there as well, which I think are a good uh, practical application of what we do as instructional designers. But again, and I'm very focused right now on instructional design which obviously this applies to whatever whatever discipline you have. So you mentioned in, in the back channel, you had a couple before we're running out of time here, you mentioned you had some, did you get all the links in that you wanted to? Yeah, I think so. Man. I think those are the only, um, the only ones I had at the QEP, the master's program, my portfolio. Yeah, pretty much everything. Very good. Well, I, anything else? Any questions in the chat? I mean, I've got... I'm sure I'll think of more. <laughs> then we'll have you back. We could talk all day. <laughs> we could talk all day. So. I'm um, sure they don't want to hear us all day. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I could just ask you a couple quick questions, more back to the faculty and working with the faculty perspective. So do you think it makes sense to have, you know, you're saying you're, you're having your event. Is that the idea of the event is to share best practices of how people are using these applied learning opportunities or what is the, the real focus? Yeah, we've noticed a lot in working uh, with faculty that they tend to live in their little box like this box I'm in right here. And mm -hmm. it's hard for them to get out. They're so busy. They have their courses. They have their research. Absolutely. They have everything going Came on. Last, when I spoke to the um, woman last week, um, the professor in um, Binghamton, she said, some people, you're working for tenure. You've got all this other junk going on. And this is just one more one thing more dumped thing. in their lap, yeah. Right, and so um, sharing has been the biggest positive professional development thing that we've put in place, where we have like a colloquium style event where the faculty comes in and just talks about and shows their course and talks about, their, much like we've been doing right here, mm -hmm. um, and they're like, oh, I could do that in my class. 
Oh, mm-hmm. you know, and they get ideas and um, but it's it's having the time to have that kind of sharing yeah. session. And so with our colloquium sessions like that, we record them much like you're doing. We put them on the website. They can watch them later if it's inconvenient. But the idea for our conference was uh, to have something local where the business and industry, the K-12 uh, environment, and the university environment, we're all in this community working together um, and to share. And since, you know, it falls in line with our QEP as well. Uh, there used to be a North Carolina conference called Teaching and Learning with Technology that was from the UNCGA. Um, I don't know if all you, if you know this, mm-hmm. but UNCGA is a 16 university system that includes 16 universities in North Carolina, and UNCW is one of them. UNC Chapel Hill and UNC Asheville. There's a bunch of uh, universities. So there was a collaborative at the G the general administration level that that threw a conference every year. But when budgets got slashed, that conference disappeared. Mm-hmm. And we we missed it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people have missed it. And so we we we're trying to um you know, fill that gap and mm-hmm. start that collaboration and sharing again. So that's a good, good question. Um in the last two sessions I obviously I'm reaching out to people in different universities. So and I, I don't think you can answer this. I don't know if anyone can answer this. So this whole idea of collaboration outside your university, um, which I th- you just said was was valuable, are people kind of squeamish about that in terms of even sharing resources or, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, like I asked, for example, I asked you if you could share with me your project con- contract and things like that. Do you think that's, where's the, where do you think that falls as far as, will, will professors feel protective of what they're doing or I think it, it depends we see mm-hmm. we it depends on the person it depends yeah. on um, we've seen it a lot where people get very proprietary over their um, work and we've seen people are like yeah just go in my course take whatever you want mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. because I have I'm, I have blackboard administrative access here on our campus so I can go in my <laughs> course if I want to but right. I don't unless I have permission um, but they'll just be like, yeah, go log yourself in, have have a heyday, get whatever you want. Um, yeah. And I think it's it's very hit or miss. I think our campus as a whole is more on the proprietary mm-hmm. um, side. And I, but I think that's ch- changing, will change more over time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and, and in the chat room, folks are talking about too, is um, what, and I think that would be a goal of mine with my Designers for Learning platform, to have kind of a roster of, if you're about to embark on this, here's some things to consider, and you know, make it a collaborative uh, where everybody can contribute what works for them. And um, it, it's like you're saying, some are going to be more willing to do it, and some are going to say, I don't want to take the time, and I don't want to share my stuff. <laughs> so, right, yeah, yeah, we'll just see. Um, but then I think there was a, a yeah, probably a says, good. Go ahead. Did you, did you see says uh, describe a favorite project. Yes, by I was going to say maybe that would that would be maybe a good place for us to put a nice little bow on our conversation. Gosh, that's so hard of sixteen years of teaching. Well, <laughs> it's probably easy like, to remember some of the disasters sometimes. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Oh, gosh, that's really difficult. I'd have to say one of my favorite projects that we did um, was when I taught AP statistics in high school. We had, and I let them pick, we did a major like class project because there was only seven or eight kids in the class, so it was a whole class project, research project, and they wanted to look at um, gender biasness of teachers, Mm. which was interesting, but it's hard to do if you don't have access to the classroom without the teacher knowing what you're doing (laughs) Mm because they would have to go in and observe. Mm -hmm. So I had to get uh, permission from the uh, the principal to basically lie to the faculty and let them know that we, you know if we were coming in the class for some other reason to observe something different to, or whatever. to observe mm-hmm. something different so mm-hmm. they could actually observe and they 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 took all this data on teachers that called on different students and all of it was anonymous we kept everything anonymous but then I made them go and present the results at a faculty meeting and mm-hmm. tell the faculty exactly what they had done and it was the most interesting faculty meeting I think I've ever been to uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, because the students were there, some faculty were very upset, and you could yeah. tell that they were very upset, but uh-huh. they did not want to be upset in front of the students. The students. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were really trying to keep their professionalism about, it was really, and several people came up to me after the faculty meeting and was 
where it was very complimentary, several people just left. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was very controversial in that sense, but I, I thought it was really an interesting and learning experience for the students to see that, mm -hmm. um, that some people were upset, and they, they couldn't understand. They were like, mm -hmm. oh, why are they upset? I don't right. understand. And, and so it turned into a very interesting conversation and moment and something that I'll never forget, uh, definitely. And I think this touches on, again, it's a very nice bow to end our conversation, but it touches on a lot of the stuff you've talked about is like the realism of it. It, it, it like draws the student in. It's authentic. Um, the stakes are a little higher. It's a little bit messier. Yeah. <laughs> but usually with messy, you kind of get, like I was like my messy magical thing. It's like you can't get magical unless you have some degree of messiness in it. Exactly. Because it's too planned out. It just doesn't seem to work. Right. It's too um, perfect. There's it's like... Too, yeah, and then that's not how, you know, life, how is. life <laughs> is. Yeah, And I think if your example touches on so many things, and it gets back to, like, what skills are we actually teaching? Like, the ethics of even what you, the underlie what you even did, you know, that could right. be a whole conversation. And that's come up. I've had um, students in our, and again, we're only in the, what, fifth week of my class, where they're already hearing stuff in their interviews talking to employees that are getting beyond the scope of what, they're there to talk about and they're like well what do I do with this information you know now that they've told me blah 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 about whatever they it might be what, what do I what do I do <laughs> so I, I, sometimes I don't have like you were saying before I don't have the answers I don't know right. so awesome and Anything it's interesting else, they, please oh go ahead I don't know uh, they're that. saying there that the great story that they're, they're like if the shoe fits and they were talking about calling out the teachers well it turned out the results really weren't that interesting <laughs> to be honest oh so it was pretty, there really story. wasn't a lot of gender bias necessarily there was a little bit like the the female teachers tended to call on boys more but I, I you could argue that that was um, you know boys are just more boisterous because they're going through their growth spurts and that so they're demanding of more attention so you could you could talk a, a lot about that but um, it was just interesting presenting the results um, right. but the, I don't think the results were anything that were you know out of the Right. realm of possibilities. <laughs> but that's really kind of interesting. On a prior show um, ages ago, we had a conversation about, um, you know, the idea of having all boys girl schools and all girls schools for some of the ideas. I mean, this is, uh, some people consider this a very real issue is that, you know, there may be a need to have, give girls the opportunity to learn independently from boys. You know, those are whole... Right. That's that, a whole, that, yeah. That's I a mean, whole thing, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. <laughs> other thing. Um, um, so when well, we question she's asking oh what are your thoughts about instruction about that Coursera course I was reading oh, about yeah. that yeah, that got canceled that was supposed to be on online course design <laughs> that was yeah. a big disaster right? I, I signed up for that I do that a lot just as a lurker I never really intend to fully go I mean I wouldn't have enough hours in the day and um, just to comment on what my personal impressions were the first few weeks I watched um, a couple things. I think it was a 40,000 some uh, enrollment and they were using some te technologies that would inherently crash after, like for example, Google Docs, you can't have 40,000 people go on it at once. Right. It's a limit of 50, they said, right? Yeah, so there was that issue, a technology glitch. But then there's also, I, like I was saying before, the ma messy with the magical. I think you have, if you're going to in, in enroll 40,000 people and nobody's really done that before you have to be able to kind of think on your feet and roll with the punches I think they pulled the pull-up plug too soon I think if they would have you know had like kind of a quick plan B saying okay you know what we're gonna in this group idea for this course unfortunately it's not gonna work out until we figure out a way to manage the technology but we're gonna still continue to proceed with this aspect of the course I th you know I think there that would have solved a whole lot of PR problems and I think a whole lot of design problems but they chose just to abandon ship and I think that was unfortunate. That's just yeah. my two cents of, of what happened and I'm sure mm -hmm. if you asked the other 44,000 people or they you know they'd have a different <laughs> different opinion but I think most people were pleased generally with what the content of the class was. I just think it was um, more the facilitation once they they got underway. Right. So. Well, thank you so much, Beth. Yay! This was yeah. awesome. Thank you. Will you play along another time, too? Sure. Anytime. I love awesome. this stuff. <laughs> well, I think what I'm going to do is just to formalize some of this. We were getting some good conversations going, and even just the verbiage. Just like I said, last week she was calling everything service learning. I think Rick Schweer called it something different. You're calling it what? Applied learning? Is that what you're That's what we call it on our applied campus. Applied learning. Yeah. And so I think maybe we're all doing about the same thing, but we're all talking about it with different, different ways. ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for those in the chat room. And I'll get everything posted online, and we can look at listen to recordings later. So thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. Y'all have a good day.
See my southern 